Hey everybody, Coach Jason here. Um, what I want to do today is I want to go over some of the more um, sometimes overlooked things uh, with regards to training and racing, but at the same time of critical importance. Uh, tapering, peaking, periodization, stuff like that, and how I'd like to implement them, how I recommend they be implemented. Again, it's completely up to you as an athlete or a coach, but um, having utilized these components over two decades as an athlete and a coach, I've kind of been able to identify um, some of the important physiological components and how they relate to training, uh, as well as what generally works and what doesn't work, um, and uh, trying to put you in a position to not only run your best, but put your athletes in a position to run their best when it counts the most. Okay, So let's go over a few things, and I'll give you some explanations as we go along here. Okay, It is absolutely critical to have a balance of the right training load and recovery, okay, simultaneously, and knowing when and how much to cycle in and out of training. Now this depends on not only your age, but your running experience or the age and experience of your athletes, their fitness levels, and um, what they're training for, okay. Those are all important components, but um, load and recovery You'll see what I mean a little bit later on, but the bottom line is if you're doing the right training and recovering at the same time all along the way, then there's no need to make drastic changes the last one or two weeks of a season in the hopes that you're going to recover or peak. Um, and all of a sudden these drastic changes are going to come and you're going to feel like a million bucks. If you're doing the right things all along, then you're going to feel in peak form exactly when you need to feel anyway. And... Um, You'll see in a minute with the next thing that I talk about how it kind of correlates to this. And that is a progressive approach to training. So a three to four week cycle with different dynamics and adaptations. If you've seen any of my training videos, and I've got a lot of them on here, so I recommend it. I definitely encourage you to uh, subscribe to my page because it will give you direct access to all my videos. You will see how I break down 16 week marathon training programs week by week, 12 week cross country or half marathon training, training programs week by week and you will see three to four week blocks of training and different stimuli introduced every cycle. Different components of training introduced so that you're hitting races on the upswing at the end. You're being at your best at the very end instead of on the downtrend because of either fatigue or something else, doing something for too long. The reason why I tie these two together is because when it comes to peaking, and we'll talk about this a little later, peaking centerly the theory that, or the mindset for some, that, that making a drastic change and all of a sudden be turning yourself into a sprinter the last one or two weeks of the season is going to make guarantee that you're, you're going to run your best when it counts the most. The reason why I have an issue with that is because it does take three to four weeks to adapt to a certain stimuli of training. And if you're only doing it with one to two weeks left, you're not giving yourself enough chance to adapt to the change in training that you're uh, undergoing. Additionally, by turning yourself into a sprinter, you're replacing a lot of the stuff that's already worked and replacing it with something that you don't know is going to work. So don't replace a guarantee with something that's unpredictable. Just my opinion, but I do hope that you'll consider that. Okay, and it will be relevant as we go along here. Okay, next, the, this is obvious. Okay, some of these things are really obvious, but I think they're important to reinforce. The goal is to be at your strongest, your fittest, and your best at the end of the season when it counts the most. Now, in high school and college, you will have some, and particularly during track, you will have some races that you need to qualify for along the way. Um, it's not like cross country where you have a regionals, it's one day you qualify, you go. Track, you have to qualify for states, nationals, and so on, and you need to hit a standard. So generally, you know, you have to be sharp much earlier on in the season um, to put yourself in a position to have a few attempts or a few tries at qualifying for something you want to qualify for. Okay, so the approach to training is slightly different there. Um, you could also utilize your fitness from, uh, from cross country and extend the season a few weeks and try to get a qualifier get that qualifier and then take a little bit of time off and then rebuild, you could do that as well. That's, that's an approach that I know some people use with a lot of success. Okay, But obviously you want to be fittest when it counts the most. Let's use an example of the New York City Marathon. There's like 50,000 people who run this marathon. Okay, And it's this fall. It's every fall. <clears throat> and But majority of people are going to be doing what they need to do to be at their best 
at the marathon. So you're not only you doing what you need to do, but you're going up against a bunch of other people. Um, if you're a competitive, if you're in a competitive nature, you're going up against a lot of people who are training for the same thing you're training for. So, and you want to be at your very best. And you know, the bigger the you know, the the bigger the races are, the more pressure there is. Um, if you're a competitive athlete. But, uh, you know, there is anxiety even if it's a half marathon or a marathon. So you want to make sure that you're doing the appropriate work along the way. Okay. Training to go harder, longer, and faster over time is in line with the racing schedule. Okay. Um, whether you're training for a half marathon or a marathon, if you plug in races along the way, obviously you're training to put yourself in a position to run longer and harder and faster at the end. So you're gradually introducing more volume or more intensity, not at the same time, um, over the course of your training cycle. You have to prepare yourself to run longer and faster, just like you do in 5K or 10K or cross country. You're putting yourself in a position to run a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more at race pace or your goal race pace. Okay, It's no different here. And the way that the seasons are laid out, particularly in high school and cross country, the bigger races are mid-season and towards the end of the season, so the pressure gets a little bit higher, so the preparation gets more intense. Okay? And you start to introduce different stimuli and different components that become a lot more intense, that make you more race ready. Okay, So that's the goal with that. I mean, the racing should be in line with the training, and the training should be in line with the racing. Okay, Something called lactic acid. I'm sure you've heard of it. Okay, Lactic acid is a component of the anaerobic system, and most people identify it with pain and fatigue. Okay? When you start to feel junk in your arms or junk in your legs from sprinting um, or doing a hard, hard, hard repeat. Okay? This can make sustaining a certain pace in a race or in a workout more difficult. Okay? Um, and the point at which that starts to kind of creep up and accumulate and introduce itself, that's called the anaerobic threshold. Okay? The shorter the races are, the more relevant anaerobic training is and the more beneficial anaerobic training is and an infusion of it into your training. The longer the races are, the less beneficial it is, and we'll go over that as well. Um, but the bottom line is if you're training for a marathon, don't turn yourself into a 3K, 5K run of the last two weeks of the season. If you're training for a 10K, don't turn yourself into a half mile of the last week or two of the season. Okay, It's not going to benefit you the way that you think it is. Okay, so Just keep that in mind as well. Right, let's take this down. Let's go to the next one. I mentioned this already. Peaking. Okay. This is one of the questions that I've over time kind of learned to ask. Um, not on my training, but the training of my athletes. Is it necessary to make a drastic change in your training with one to two weeks left to your goal race or championship race? in order to consider yourself ready to peak. Now, like I said before, if you've been training um, and recovering appropriately along the way, you're going to be in peak form anyway, and you'll feel that you're in peak form. Okay? If you haven't done the appropriate work, making a drastic change at the end isn't really going to make you feel like you did do uh, the appropriate work, and it may even throw your body out of rhythm. Like I said a minute ago, don't turn yourself into a shorter event athlete when you're a longer event athlete. It's just not going to work, especially in the one to two weeks, uh, you know, with when there's one to two weeks left. Like I said before, it takes three to four weeks to adapt to a training cycle. If you introduce something with a week to two out, it's not going to benefit you the way you think. You don't have enough time to adapt. So, and here's the answer. No, it is not. Okay. Three to four weeks of adaptation cycles remain, whether you are building and training at the beginning of the season for a long season ahead or approaching the final month of the training. The same thing applies. Whether you're going up or down, same thing. You need to be able to adapt to whatever, um, whatever is new to the training. And let's just say if you've been training, let's say, 80 miles per week for a long period of time, if you're going to cut volume, the way to do it is not to go 70, 60, 50, 40 the last four weeks. Drop it to 60, hold it there for the four weeks. And you're adapting to a new lower volume, okay? Having to drop volume every week, you're you're constantly making a change every week. So it's harder to adapt to that than it is to drop it and then maintain a lower volume, okay, while maintaining most of your intensity along the way. So um, that same three to four week cycle applies no matter what you do.
significant. And again, the science does not really suggest and it doesn't verify that making that drastic change in your training in the final one to two weeks is going to make you peak or feel drastically different or feel a hell of a lot better than you did two weeks prior to that. There's really nothing out there that suggests that it's a magic workout or a magic um, week or two that you that basically changes everything you've done the three months prior. It just doesn't work like that. Okay. If you've been training and recovering properly, and I've said this all along, then why would you need to make such a change in hopes of recovering and peaking? You know, if you're doing the right things all along the way, you are already going to be in peak form when you need to be in peak form. Okay? You do not need to sacrifice an important part of training that's been working and replace it with something that is uncertain. I mentioned that too. Don't cut away your threshold. And if you're, if you're training for a longer race, let's say a 10K, don't cut away your threshold running and your 1,000 meter repeats and, sub and substitute it with 200 meters and 400 meter repeats at mile pace. You know, you can maybe cut them a, a, a thousand rep or two and then add some 200s or 400s, but to completely take away something that's been working and replace it with something that is unpredictable, is uh, could it could backfire. So just be careful. Be very careful of that. Okay. Training and recovering together helps make sure the appropriate adaptations take place. So again, if you're training and recovering along the way, then adapting to the next four week cycle of training becomes easier and it becomes smoother, a smoother transition into every cycle of training if you're plugging in a cross-training day or a complete off day. And I do encourage you to do them. It's completely up to you as to how often when you want to do it. It's based on, I generally base it on age and experience and what you're training for. Um, but as you get older, the need for a total off day um, either gets less frequent, actually as you get fitter and more experienced, um, becomes less frequent and... Um, you know, less not necessary and less necessary because I do think it's less necessary. But as you get fitter, you kind of take less off days. But again, that doesn't mean don't take one when you need one. So now let's put this one down. Last one here. Okay. Whether it be cross country or those longer races like the half marathon, 10K, and the road marathon, okay, the primary training component or catalyst and demand is aerobic, okay? It's important to remember that because drastically cutting volume, and I said this repeatedly, um, each week in an effort to peak, it can send the wrong physiological message to your body, okay? Your body does need to cont the continual capacity to be able to carry oxygen and blood volume, all right? And throwing it out of whack with a couple weeks to go, you know, can affect your ability to perform at your highest level when you need it. Any volume decrease should be cyclical as well. Like I said, the final three or four weeks of the season, lower and hold. So drop it and hold. Okay? Don't drop, 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 drop. Especially for a marathon. <clears throat> Especially for a marathon. Okay? And again, other another way of breaking this down, the longer the race is, the less necessary and the less beneficial hard and aerobic work is. Okay? Like I said, if you're training for a marathon, there's no need to become a 3K or a 5K runner the last two weeks of the season. Okay? And if you're training for a 5K, 10K, there's no need to become a half mile of the final one to two weeks of the season. All right, That can disrupt what's been working Okay, in those final two weeks. And doing that in the final two weeks or two, again, can backfire. So it's very important that you're cognizant of that and careful of that. Okay? When fatigue okay, starts kicking in, it is tougher to remain focused, but it's also more important to remain focused, okay? Because it is going to be more difficult to not only maintain the pace, but to pick up the pace. But that's also where progressive training comes into <clears throat> comes into effect. So if you're, let's say, a marathon, and your goal is eight minutes per mile, right? Um, starting out at 7.30 per mile for the first 10 miles is not the game plan. If, you're game, if, you, if your goal is eight minutes per mile, it might be more beneficial to you to start out at 815, 820s and then work your way down to 8s and then if you're feeling good to go under 8s, that's a progressively increased training. So it's similar to progression runs, progression workouts. You start conservatively, you build in the pace. Um, instead of starting out too fast, having a grizzly bear jump on your back and then 
especially in a marathon. It's not like a 5K or a mile. You can come back the following week if you have an off day. If you deviate from the race plan in a marathon, you know, it's not a teddy bear jumping on your back. It's a grizzly bear. So it takes a lot longer to recover from a half marathon in a marathon than it does a much shorter race. So progressive training should be in line with a progressive reigning, racing approach. If you're good at maintaining pace, especially if it's a flat course, great. There will be pace deviations as well in rolling courses. That's obvious, but um, not deviating aggressively in the beginning uh, from your race approach is very, very, very important. So if you have a race plan, stick with it and don't deviate from it at least uh, until, you know, if you have to marathon, until at least you're halfway throughout the race, 13 miles in, or if you're running a half marathon, six to eight miles in. Um, at that point, if you feel good and you feel like you can go or go with somebody, as long as it's gradual, as long as the training is there to support it, then right, you know, you probably can you'll probably be okay. Okay. Now, race week, one last thing I want to go over. <clears throat> Cut the workout in half. Okay, if it's a marathon, if it's a half marathon, whatever it is, 10K, if you were planning on doing 10 by 800, cut it down to 5. The work is already done. There's no need to do more, okay? And there's no need to pump lactic acid into your legs. And you're not going to get that from the longer repeats anyway, but there's no need to do anything different. Um, cutting the volume back um, can just give you a little bit of additional um, recovery component without having to drastically cut the volume for the week. Okay, what you can do, you can add a couple of 50 meter strides afterward, or if you do the mar if you do the workout four days out, then two days later, which is two days out, you know, do a short run and then add some 50 to 100 meter strides after the run. Okay, if you do it five days out from your race, then you can come back two days later, which is three days out, and do some short accelerations, a little bit longer, maybe 150 to 200 meters. Not that many, just to get the legs turning over. You want to keep a consistent rhythm of going hard every couple days, even in race week. Okay, maintain your rhythm. Um, my personal recommendation, from what from my experience, is five days out, and three days out. I like to give, especially for a half marathon and a marathon, I like to give an off day two days before the race, and not the day before the race. Um, a day before the race can throw your legs out of rhythm. And you may not feel as good on race day, so I generally like to give a day off two days prior. Then just do an easy two to three mile shakeout run the day before the race to get back into the running groove. And then you go, go time for your race. So just my personal recommendation, but it's completely up to you to decide what you want to do. I hope what I've, uh, what I've shared today is helpful and beneficial. Hopefully you find something that's applicable to what you're doing. Um, and, um, if you find this content valuable, please kick the like button and please click the subscribe button. By clicking the subscribe button, you'll have direct access to all my training videos. And uh, I've got a couple of dozen that I think you might like um, and, uh, fi and find quite valuable because they are broken down in detail like no other video is out there for 16 whole weeks, for 12 whole weeks. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, if you want to leave a comment down below, please do so. If you have any questions of a more personal nature, please don't hesitate to, uh, if you need personal guidance, my email is blackbeltrunningcoach at gmail.com. I also have an Instagram page, it's blackbeltrunningcoach. I put a lot of running content on there as well that I think you'll find valuable. And it's very similar to what I post on YouTube. Um, so with that said, I hope you find this valuable. Have a great season. Train hard, train smart. Let's go get them.